following program on Other Than 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. This is an opinion-based program. Viewer discretion is advised. Tonight, freedom of speech at the center of Sri Lanka's new narrative. Can we speak about what happened? A nation's path is changing by the minute. The question we all need to ask is whether this path is as per the aspirations of Sri Lankans, or is it as per an agenda that serves the rest of the world? The economy is in dire straits, while the political bickering has never changed. Despite the upheaval we witnessed few months back, the lesson the protesters set out to teach the politicians has fallen on deaf ears. At the same time, many groups with ulterior motive reap the benefits of the public's protest. Tonight we ask the fundamental question, are we on the right track? And is that track something beneficial for all of us? Joining me tonight on this returning episode of State of the Nation, I'm honoured to be joined by Professor Yanis Varoufakis, the former Finance Minister of Greece, Australian political economist Professor Gigi Foster, and the world's highest rated talk show host and an individual who continues to speak his mind, Fox News host and host of Tucker Carlson Tonight, Mr. Tucker Carlson himself. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny, and this is the state of the nation. Good evening, good to see you everyone back on the program. I am glad to be back on the air. Well, you know what happened. I guess time has proven what was correct and who was correct. And for all tricksters, fake journalists, who talk about media freedom yet have no clue how to practice it. Fake human rights lawyers who don't care about the rights of 22 million people but only the rights of a specialized group. I understand why it was vital for you to get rid of me. Because I was calling and exposing your bull. Guess what? Time has proven that your effort was futile, just like your hopes on the IMF to save our nation. I think it's time the radical liberal brigade asked themselves what exactly is your version of freedom of speech? Shutting down everyone who disagrees with you, create an echo chamber that only gives one opinion. And no, I'm not saying you don't have the right to react to what I say. You absolutely do. And that's precisely what I expect as well. Disagree, argue and have a proper dialogue. But boycotting because you don't like what I say? Don't you think that's a bit petty and sad? Well, let's keep the sadness, pettiness and hatred of those uh, radical Colombo liberals and move on to important matters that we need to talk about tonight. Shortly, I will be speaking to Mr. Tucker Carlson himself, who's a champion of free media and stands against any censorship. I will ask him uh, what he thinks of the US's meddling with our country's affairs. Professor Yanis Varoufakis will also join me. He was the finance minister of Greece during the time its economy collapsed and he has first-hand experience with dealing with the IMF and why he says that Sri Lanka ought to be careful. Also tonight uh, um, joining me is Professor Gigi Foster who has been on my other show several times. She's a powerful advocate against lockdowns and shutdowns. Now during my interview uh, with her back in 2021, she said a country like Sri Lanka would definitely face hardships due to erroneous and reckless unnecessary shutdowns that would impact the economy. Here we are experiencing just that. But first, in my opening statement. As much as many would like to know what happened, we do not have precious time to waste dwelling in the past. We as a society, as a nation, and as people need to move forward. Why? Simple. Because we are in a pile of unknown excrements. Our economy is broken, our society is divided, and our politic politics is, well, not working for us. We need to ask whether we are better off 
than a few months ago. Are we as a nation on the right track? And are we doing everything right? If you ask that question from a rad radical liberal who took our nation towards global shame by engaging in all nefarious activities, he or she would say yes, not because it's the right thing, it's because simply to justify their misguided erroneous actions. We all know what's happening apparently. Everyone wanted to change the system, but not a single joker knew how to do it. Or the ones who knows how to do it don't want to talk about it. This is never the best way forward as a nation. Although everyone would try to tell you that it's over for Sri Lanka and that Western assistance will su and support will only be the way forward, I've got something else to say to them. Are you nuts? We can absolutely solve this problem. It's not something happening for the first time. We all know what needs to be done. And we all know the solutions for this current economic crisis lies within the country and never on a, uh, on a system or a solution baked outside of our nation. We know what to do, but to implement that, we must change our thinking and attitude. That's the only thing we've not changed thus far. We've changed political parties, presidents, prime ministers, governments and officials. Heck, we even changed our allegiance from the east to the west. So everything should be better right now. You know it's not. The only thing we didn't change is our thinking and our attitude towards this country and nation. Several so-called economic think tanks operated by half-baked economists propel the idea of going to the IMF. In our previous program, we have been showcasing why this is a bad idea for Sri Lanka and that we should look at solutions internally, not externally. Or at least, our dealings with the IMF should and must be something better for us, not better for the creditors. Now, Greece is such a country that went through a uh, went through somewhat identical economic crisis uh, to Sri Lanka. For them, too, the IMF was pitched as the saving grace. This lending body's erroneous decision was one reason for the country to full, fall towards such a massive economic crisis. Joining me now, uh, all the way from Athens, Greece, via Zoom, is Professor Yanis Varoufakis. He was the former Greece finance minister back in 2015. Professor, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to join me in order to share your ideas on, 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 on the economic crisis here in Sri Lanka. Now, currently, you know what's happening in, in, in this nation. Um, with regard to our economy, all hopes and advice by think tanks in Colombo are uh, telling us um, and I have to also told the government to go to the IMF and now we are at a point of no return on those negotiations. We're pretty much, you know, wrapping up the deal for that. You tweeted advising Sri Lanka to refrain from going to the IMF. Why is that? And if that's your point of view, what's the best way forward for us? Pain is unavoidable when you go bankrupt. There's no doubt about that. There are no easy solutions. Anybody who promises the good people of Sri Lanka an easy solution is a charlatan and should be completely and utterly ignored. Yeah. Uh, however, there is a profound difference between pain, which is an investment into future prosperity, and pain, which is a pointless investment into more pain, if you understand what I'm saying. To use a medical language or parallel that, um, you know, People in the financial sector use often uh, when they refer to the IMF's policies. When the IMF comes to a place like Greece, a place like Sri Lanka, a place like Argentina, a place like, like the United Kingdom, don't forget that the United Kingdom sought the help of the IMF in 1976, for those who, <laughs> whose memories goes, go that long back. Um, the standard argument is that, okay, the IMF is like the doctor who comes to uh, deliver um, a bitter medicine, which nevertheless is essential for you to recover. Well, if that were the case, I would be all for embracing the assistance, in inverted commas, of the IMF. Bitter medicine sometimes is essential for recovery, for a cure, right? Uh, but if you look at what the IMF did to South Korea in 1998, 
uh, to um, a, a score of African countries in, in the 1970s to my country in to, between 2010 and 2015, 2016, 2018. You see that if, this if I'm not uh, uh, mistaken, uh, the IMF apologized for wrong policy uh, uh, movement in your country. Yep, they did. And I have spoken to many good people in the IMF who have um, acknowledged that in every one of those countries that I mentioned just now, the IMF has been toxic. So, so there's a fundamental difference between, between bitter medicine and a toxic drug that actually kills the patient or makes the patient far worse. Hmm? So this is what the, uh, 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 Sri Lanka, I'm very keen that your people do not uh, swallow uh, toxic waste, thinking that it was bitter but effective medicine. This is, you know, this is the main concern that I have. Uh, and okay, look, I'm not saying that you shouldn't talk to the IMF, but to imagine that a loan from the IMF is necessarily going to be the solution to the problems that Sri Lanka is facing is simply to fly in the face of historical fact. Look at Argentina. You know, 20 years ago, the IMF committed a crime against the people of Argentina. It was a pure, unadulterated, unadulterated crime against the people of Argentina. They gave a very large, uh, very large multi-billion dollar loan to the government of Argentina to facilitate what? To facilitate the conversion of the profits of the oligarchs and some corporations from the local currency to, to American dollars so that the few oligarchs could take their money out of Argentina before Argentina collapsed and the good people who didn't benefit from this IMF loan, we then owe the money to the IMF. They did this 20 years ago. And they did it again five years ago. They did exactly the same thing in the same country. So, yeah, the fact that the IMF apologizes here and there means nothing. They are constantly repeating the same logic of, first, a loan that most of it is not going to go to the people of Sri Lanka. It's going to go to creditors who should yes. not get their money back. Because let me be absolutely clear. To anyone who points the finger at you, and I'm now addressing the people of Sri Lanka, anybody from the West who says to you, oh, you've been very naughty. You've borrowed a lot of money, now you can't repay it. And you are ethically responsible. My answer to them would be, it takes two to tango. For every irresponsible borrower, there is an irresponsible creditor. Exactly. When the banks were giving away all those mo monies to you know, shadowy characters in Sri Lanka uh, on behalf of the Sri Lankan people, uh, they were responsible for the predatory loans they were making. So the creditors of Sri Lanka must bear a very significant proportion of the cost of the bankruptcy of Sri Lanka. Anyone who Absolutely. tries... And especially the continue, IMF continue, trying to continue. Especially the IMF that always takes the side of the creditors hmm, has to be told by the government of Sri Lanka that the first, the prerequisite for any debate, any discussion with Sri Lanka, with Sri Lanka, between Sri Lanka and the International Mon Mon Monetary Fund, must be an acknowledgement by the International Monetary Fund that there will have to be a very significant debt reduction a haircut. Creditors must accept that they will not get their money back. They will, will get back a small proportion of the money they lent. Because if your government commits your people to, to pay a large percentage of an unpayable debt, an unpayable debt cannot be paid. So the only way of pretending that you will be paying it is by imposing taxation that is so high that you will kill off the, you know, the goose that lays the eggs. It will kill off the economic activity from which you would have to generate the income in order to make sure that your people can survive and that you pay your debts. So the first, the prerequisite for any deal with any creditor and the international fund, monetary fund, must be a very significant help. The second prerequisite must be that no austerity, 
that the logic of reducing the debt and the budget deficit based on spending cuts, spending cuts at a time when the Sri Lankan domestic private sector is massively reducing its expenditure because of the crisis, to introduce public sector spending cuts is, is, is madness. Because it's not like a shop. Sri Lanka is not a shop. It is not a family. You and I, Prof. if Sir, we have a... Uh, Prof. I'm wondering, uh, in case you were given the opportunity again uh, to be Greece's finance minister in order to find solutions for its economic crisis, uh, what would you have done differently? I would actually do what I tried to do. Because remember, I came in at the end of the crisis. Uh, I um, tried to, to negotiate with the IMF. Um, I even stopped payments to the IMF in order to, make, to, to signal to Washington, D.C. that um, their policies uh, were catastrophic for my country. And we clashed. We clashed. We had an almighty clash in 2015 to the extent that um, I left the government when my prime minister succumbed and signed another deal with the IMF. Uh, to, to give you an idea, uh, we went bankrupt because we had a debt of about 300 billion euros. Okay. Uh, today, as we speak, we have a debt of 400 billion. Our, debt, our income back then, when we became bankrupt, was 240 billion. Today is less than 200. So you can see the kind of destruction that the IMF has left behind. And it's very important that Sri Lanka learns from that lesson. Stop thinking of the IMF as your savior. The IMF is not your savior. The IMF is your potential destroyer. So put this in your head. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't talk to them because they are a very important international organization. Maybe they've learned their lesson. But for Sri Lanka to get, to get something decent, a decent deal out of the IMF, there are two prerequisites. The first one, there has to be a massive reduction in your debt before you borrow a penny. Don't borrow any money from the IMF before there is an international agreement with your bankers, whether they are European, American, or Chinese, of significantly refusing, uh, uh, reducing the debt because you will not be able to pay it. Even if you borrow, especially if you borrow, and especially if you borrow under conditions, and that's the second condition, the second prerequisite of austerity, of fiscal austerity. If the IMF makes it a condition that the, your government should reduce massively spending at the time when your private sector is already reducing spending, private expenditure, private investment massively because of the crisis, what is the sum of private and public expenditure? It's your national income. Your national income is going to go further down if your government agrees to austerity imposed by the IMF. Where is your repayments going to come from to the IMF if your national income carries on shrinking? These are the two conditions. Debt restructure, debt reduction, and secondly, no fiscal austerity. If the IMF is not prepared to grant you that, no deal should be signed between the government of Sri Lanka and the IMF. Well, uh, we have to leave it at that. Uh, our full interview with Professor Yanis Varoufakis will be on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Uh, Professor Yanis Varoufakis, thank you very much uh, for your time. I certainly appreciate um, being, um, you being kind enough to share your ideas with our audience. I will be right back with Professor Gigi Foster. This is State of the Nation. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. I'm now joined by Professor Gigi Foster, who is the Professor of Economics at the University of New South Wales. Uh, she joins me now from Sydney, Australia via Zoom. And she has a new book on uh, assessing steps uh, taken to curb the COVID pandemic titled, Do Lockdowns and Border Closures Serve the Greater Good? 
Thank you very much, Professor, for joining me uh, and good to see you once again. Professor, earlier on uh, the show, I spoke to with uh, former finance minister of Greece about their dealings with the IMF. Right now, Sri Lanka is in the midst of a full-blown economic crisis. What's your advice to this nation? Well, first of all, it's not about tweaking. Um, you do need significant reforms. And again, I'll point to the political corruption. This helps if you understand that there is such political corruption. You understand that spending more on items that are going to help the entrenched elite secure non-starving uh, class of people in Sri Lanka is not going to help the country as a whole. As you know, the max amount of economics is social welfare as a whole, not just the welfare of the people at the top. So the first thing is to work out how to get more of the money that Sri Lanka does have, which is not much, allocated to the needs of the people who are at the bottom, who have faced the biggest costs due to the decisions made by the elite during this period. So that might, for example, consist of healthcare funding. It might consist of subsidizing food. Uh, it might consist of if you are going to give tax relief, give tax relief on things that the, the poor buy most and food, perhaps a bit of energy and and try to up the tax rates on people who are wealthier. In relation to your interactions with external overseas bodies that may or may not be willing to give you money or loan you money, I would definitely be playing the humanitarian card. Uh, state that this crisis has come about because of the madness that took hold of elites around the world, including in the WHO. And then in some sense, it's not just Sri Lanka's fault that it has fallen into this economic sure. catastrophe. It is the fault of the whole world and certainly the fault of the elites that led us there, um, who basically ignored the information that was known at the time about how costly these lockdowns were likely to be. So in those negotiations, you can you can try to play that card. Um, I also think that you, you you do have to look at the broader political sphere and note that India is getting closer to China these days. And of course, I, I saw that you've had some dealings with China in relation to a military base. I'm not sure I'd go in that direction, but certainly cozying up in some way to China as a, a, a hand up, um, perhaps following a model similar to the charter cities type model, like a Macau kind of situation where you say maybe give a lease to China or indeed to a Western power if you wish of a section, a little region of Sri Lanka and say, yeah. look, in this area, this area is now called Germany or France or Canada or China and give the institutional backing from that existing country to try to lift up the people and businesses in that section and hope that then that spreads throughout the country. Absolutely, Professor. Professor Gigi Foster, we had to leave it at that. I sincerely appreciate your time. The full interview with uh, Professor Gigi Foster will be on our YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com slash English. Back in a moment. Welcome back everyone. Let's talk about freedom of speech. Guess what? I had no one else in mind other than Mr. Tucker Carlson himself. The host of Fox News Channel's Tucker Carlson tonight. He is a force to reckon with and he joins me now from New York via Zoom. Thank you very much Tucker for being here. I really appreciate it. To give an idea to our viewers, Tucker's show, Tucker Carlson tonight, is the most watched show in all of cable news in the world actually, delivering an average total audience of around 2.8 million viewers a night. Well, it makes all the other cable news channel shows in the same slot in America, and perhaps in the entire world, look basically like bad comedy shows, especially on CNN. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tucker, for uh, taking the time to speak to us here in Sri Lanka. I know you are new to this demography, but I really wanted to speak to you and uh, get your uh, viewpoints because you truly believe in freedom of speech and conservative ideology and you believe it is the best way forward for any nation. I mean, basically, be proud of who you are and where you come from. 
Now, you know in recent times uh, what happened here in Sri Lanka, a democratically elected leader was overthrown in an undemocratic manner, basically through a mob. That's the gist of events in the past few months here in Sri Lanka. Now, when we analyze everything, we see a lot of liberal ideology uh, taking center stage. Despite that, we also have, be, uh, have to blame the former president uh, because he didn't act when he was supposed to do and didn't do his job. So basically, he got what he deserved. Anyhow, even though we in this part of the world say that liberalism is a Western issue and a Western problem in recent months, we have seen that not only in the West, but we here in Sri Lanka, and also in some parts of the East, suffer from that same liberal ideology. We have a lot of youth who are completely sold on the liberal agenda and instead of asking the basic questions of whether they really solve the problem, they are swift to worship it. Taka, I really want to get your take on this. Liberal ideology seems to be such a pain in the behind all over the world, isn't it? Yes, and it emanates, I'm sad to say, from universities in the United States. My problem with it is not essentially ideological, though I disagree on a philosophical level with those ideas. My problem is that those ideas don't serve the countries they're implemented in very well. So if you run a country, your first duty is to protect that country, not other countries, not the planet, you know, not the climate, but your country. That's what you were hired to do. And the way that you protect your country is by paying attention to the three most important things, which are food, water, and energy. You need secure supplies of those three things or else people can't live. And when you see governments that fail to pay attention to food, water, and energy, which are the basis of any economy, of course, then you're looking at a bad government that is not serving its people adequately, period. And I don't care what they tell you. I don't care what sort of liberation movement they claim to be acting on behalf of. If they're ignoring the basics, food, water, and energy, and they're serving other countries or some abstract idea or some association of countries over their own country, they're not doing a good job. Indeed. And they have no right to lead, in my opinion. Uh, that is so true. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, the solution, like I the other side of that whole argument is, you know, being proud about the country that you live in, be proud about uh, what you have. It, it may not be the best thing in the world, but still it has room uh, for improvement and you should do it from the point of where you live and what is best for the country, just like what you said. But then again, yeah. that conservatism ideology is being labeled as something so uh, uh, old, something that is, you know, you need to do away with. We, we, we should not have that in modern society which is which is absolutely a big lie well sure and it's the same lie always you know the way we're doing things doesn't work we need something brand new and different it'll be so much better by the way i'm open to that but show me or you know is this is this society more stable is it more prosperous are people happier are families stronger do people have more self-respect and if they do, then OK, but they don't and they don't in this country. They don't in your country. They don't across all of Western Europe. Those all of those nations have become poorer and unhappier measurably. This is not a guess. We know under these ideas. So it doesn't work. It's a very alluring lie. I understand that. But in the end, if you're not benefiting from it, it's not working by definition. So, you know, I, young people are very susceptible to grand stories. You know, this is going to be amazing and you have a moral duty to do this or a moral duty not to do that. OK, great. But show me how that works. Show me how that improves my life. Will I have a job? Will I be able to get married and have children? Will they inherit a better country than the one I live in now? And the answer in every case is absolutely not. And I just personally feel so sorry for places like Sri Lanka, where I've never been. I've been to southern India, but I've never been across the water to your country. But I, I feel so sorry for countries that look west yes. for guidance, which we wise guidance, which we should be giving. 
and instead get the same basket of stupid and poisonous ideas that inevitably wind up in poverty and dictatorship. Um, it just it, it makes me feel terrible. And, and my apologies on behalf of the society that exported this garbage to you. <laughs> uh, we, we were actually a, a, a colonized uh, a country for more than 400 years. So that particular yes. ideology has been embedded through uh, to our systems. And we, we only received independence like 80 years back. So we are in, in our infancy when it comes to you know democracy and trying to figure out where we are going. And you are absolutely right. We do look to the West for guidance and, and to pretty much tell us exactly where and how we should be governing in the best way possible. And, and most of the time, Yes, we've been told that, uh, you know, these kinds of climate change is what Sri Lanka should be focusing on, whereas Sri Lanka is a, is a tiny country. We don't even contribute. I don't think we, we even emit anything. So, But we don't understand how uh, us safeguarding our uh, forests and everything is going to contribute to the globe. I mean, it, it, it might help. But then again, there are the big players. So that kind of uh, uh, BS, which, which has been always, uh, uh, you know, put down to us, basically, uh, telling that if you do it the way we tell you to do it, we will pay you, we will give you money. Uh, and that's the hook all the time. Uh, in terms of, I want to touch on something that you uh, importantly said, the youth, they want some grand story. They want something something to you know uh, uh, feel good about, uh, maybe share on their social media platforms and try to have that, but nothing is helping them at the end. Uh, that we see very, uh, uh, in an alarming way here in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, how do we actually get the message across to the youth? Because whatever said, and done, we cannot ignore that demography. That demography is vital to any country as we keep growing. Uh, how, what do you think exactly that we should be doing and we, what we are not doing? Well, I think one thing to point out relentlessly is that social media platforms are controlled, not by Sri Lankans, not even by yeah. your government. But those platforms are controlled by multinational companies based in the United States with an ideological agenda. And so if you understand the world through social media posts, you're getting a version of the truth that has been carefully curated as propaganda to convince you of things that are not true. So I think saying that out loud, reminding people that Facebook and Twitter and Google are not neutral platforms whatsoever. They're propaganda instruments of a small group of very rich people. And don't be fooled by that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I will say, I mean, look, I, I don't know the, that that's a very big question. It's a question that I think about every day here in the United States, where we have a very similar arrangement where the bulk of the population gets its news from social media platforms that lie and that censor any competing opinions or that pull facts down because they get in the way of a storyline that's fundamentally dishonest. Um, I believe, I mean, I guess I have to believe given my job that if people tell the truth slowly, precisely, carefully, calmly, um, that some will hear it. And it, it, it's sort of obvious at a certain point what the truth is. Again, just refer to the basic facts. Is your country more stable? Mm. Is it richer? Do, what percentage of people's income is going to food now as compared to three years ago? How is this working for you? And I think most people understand, if you present it that way, that it's actually not working, that it will never work. The idea that Sri Lanka is in charge of the global climate is insane. Exactly. China is the single largest emitter of carbon by far mm -hmm. in the world and no one is meaningfully pressuring china to reduce its carbon emissions they're expanding their carbon emissions so if they're telling you if they're telling some 22 year old without a job in sri lanka that it's his fault that the climate is warming you know that's just a lie actually exactly um, and they should be called out on it 
let's move on to another subject uh, in terms of uh, you know freedom of speech. Uh, you you touched upon this, uh, and you said you know if most of the people are getting their news from social media, that is a problem. In fact, that is exactly what's happening here in Sri Lanka as well, because uh, for some reason uh, the Western society has managed to showcase that this is the trend. Facebook is a trend. TikTok is a trend. Uh, Twitter is a trend. So you have to get on on, on that trend. If not, you're you're missing it out. So basically, if by any chance, if there's some kind of a trend that is occurring in the West, whether nobody uh, you know, checks and see whether is it beneficial for us, is it actually helping us, they just get on board with it and then parrot it right across all throughout because it's the fashionable thing to do. Uh, truth is yes. rarely uh, the fashionable thing to do because you know that that's going to always uh, create uncomfortable conversation. That is where I want to move uh, uh, my conversation next to freedom of speech. I understand the United States have managed to uh, actually champion it to a certain extent uh, where we don't see it he in, in this part of the world. Uh, how important is that for a democracy? It's the foundational freedom in any democracy. It's extremely easy to control people if you control their access to information. You don't need to put soldiers on the street most of the time. You just convince them that your program is the right program by eliminating all competing facts. You know, take the vaccine, it works. Mm -hmm. well, but I have questions about the vaccine. Those questions are not allowed. So people have no idea that there are things they should know but don't know they, they have no access to that information this is you know of course famously the state of affairs in in totalitarian countries places like north korea where people think you know they're the most prosperous nation on earth because they have no idea what is happening in other nations because all information is controlled by the government and increasingly that's what we have here in the united states i'm i'm embarrassed to say and so the only thing we can do to fight back is tell the truth no matter what. And of course, if, if you say things that challenge the people in power, ultimately they're gonna come for you. I mean, they're gonna try and hurt you. Uh, that's true here. I'm certain it's even more true in Sri Lanka. It and is. I think it's the moral obligation of people who believe in a free society to continue telling the truth no matter what, period. Indeed. Uh, let's take a short commercial break. Uh, I'm in conversation uh, with the host of Tucker Carlson tonight uh, on uh, Fox News Channel. Tucker Carlson himself, we're talking about uh, freedom of speech, uh, conservatism, and, and, and the issues pertaining to a liberal uh, agenda and the liberal ideology, which is not just a, uh, which we are finding here in Sri Lanka, is that it's not just an issue in the West, but it is very much an issue here in Sri Lanka as well. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to the State of the Nation. I'm in conversation with Tucker Carlson uh, himself, the host of Tucker Carlson Tonight on Fox News Channel. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the current issues uh, in Sri Lanka, which uh, most of them are stemming from the liberal uh, uh, viewpoints, which, which is trying to pretty much grapple the whole conversation and not leave room for anyone else. Um, Tucker, one of the other things uh, that, one of the other elements that plays a, plays a huge role is the media. And the United States media in, in this, like, like Fox News in themselves, they're finding out they're all alone. If they are talking about the truth, um, there's no one else who will join hands with them. And you have a whole plethora of uh, liberal, uh, or, uh, left leaning media institutions in the United States. And basically, they have the same message all across the board. Um, what do you think, like, these days, there are so much of garbage which has been uh, pretty much put down, uh, put into the minds of young children, 
even adults, they've been fooled uh, uh, across the board uh, trying to bring in certain ideology that they believe, sandwich it with something very innocent and try to present it uh, to, uh, to, um, to their audience. Uh, the importance of media's role in this story, how vital is it? Well, I think it's central and there's been a change in global media that you know i've been in this 31 years i can barely believe it as i watch it it's hard to believe it's happening but the purpose of a free media is to balance the people in power so the bulk of citizens in any country really have no idea what their government is doing and what the leaders of their largest businesses are doing they don't know and so the point of a media in a democracy is to let them know so they can vote according to their own interests. And so the media is always in opposition to power. It has to be, that's its, that's its role, that's its whole point. The second media decide their role is to protect the most powerful, then there's no one to look out for the average person. There's no one on his side at that point. And that's what you've seen, certainly in the United States, I'm, I'm certain in your country, absolutely in Western Europe, media organizations, radio, television, newspapers, internet companies have decided that their job is to protect politicians, the people in charge in big businesses. And it's bewildering. In the United States, the only large media company left that stands in opposition to the people in power is Fox News, just one in a country of 340 million people. Mm -hmm. And so what, what's interesting is that liberals, people who believe in the free exchange of ideas and in free speech, would have no problem with that. But the current liberals, who are not liberal at all, they're totalitarian, they seek a one-party state under centralized control, they're doing whatever they can to shut down yeah. Fox News. Now, I'm not upset about that simply because I work here, it's my job, I love Fox News, they're my employer. But even if I didn't work at Fox News, I would be every bit as upset because you need to have competing voices. You can't just have one voice. That's North Korea, mm -hmm. but that's what they want. And it tells you everything about their motives. Indeed. Uh, cancel culture is also piggybacking on this and apparently if you say something that, uh, I mean, uh, you are a person who, who does not give a damn about can cancel culture and you, you exactly say what you want to say. And there are a lot of other people around the world who wants to do just that, but they find it very difficult to pretty much go through that tunnel uh, where, you know, people are trying to cancel them for their viewpoints. But these are the people who say that we have to respect everybody's viewpoints, but they are the very same people who can't respect a single viewpoint that is different to theirs. So what do you think about the cancel culture? Uh, you, do you think we will see uh, this menace continuing around the world or, or are people coming to realization that this is BS? It will continue precisely as long as people put up with it. I mean, the realization that changed my life was that it's not sincere. They don't really mean it. They're, they, they're lying. So when they call you names, oh, you're a racist or you're a sexist, they don't actually think that you're a racist or a sexist. I'm not a racist. They've called me that for years. It's never really bothered me because I'm not. And they don't think that I am. The only point of saying it is to shut me down, to keep me from talking, to prevent me from criticizing them. And that's true, I think, for everybody or most people who are victims of censorship. Of censorship. It's not that they've done something wrong. They haven't. It's they've challenged the people in power. And the only way to stop that is by ignoring it. You know, you're, you're holding me to rules that I never agreed to in the first place. Oh, you can't say that. Really says who? Who made that rule? Is that a law? You decided that I'm not allowed to say that? Okay, well, I, I, I don't acknowledge your authority. How's that sound? I'm not interested in what you think. I care what the people I love and respect think of me. And I don't care what you think. I don't care what strangers think. And so if you spend your life trying to impress strangers on TikTok or Twitter or Facebook, you will be held hostage to the people in charge because they will use your desire for acceptance from these strangers to control you. And so the first step is to not care. And I, I sincerely don't care. I care what my wife thinks, yeah. my friends think, my coworkers think, my children think, but I do not care what somebody I've never met on TikTok yeah. thinks of me. Why would I care? It doesn't make sense, indeed.
Um, let's move on to another subject. One of the things that is being always discussed about in, in the in U.S. television media is uh, about uh, the current incumbent president, uh, foreign policy. Uh, that is something that is affecting us here in Sri Lanka as well. What is your view uh, about that? Well, after the 2016 election in the United States where Donald Trump won, the party that lost claimed their loss not by pointing to their own failures or their inability to convince voters to vote for them, but they claimed that Russia, Vladimir Putin, was somehow secretly interfering in the election. Now, they did an investigation of this for two years yeah. and determined that that was not true. But they convinced half the country that Russia, which is a relatively small country um, that straddles Europe and Asia, of course, very far from the United States, was the root of all of America's problems. And that idea, because it was not really challenged by anybody, grew, metastasized like a cancer, to the point where the United States is now at war with Russia. Now, I'm not against all wars, speaking for myself. Some wars are necessary. Some wars can't be avoided. It's in your interest to win all wars that you join, of course. But there is no way in which this war, which we are waging against Russia, benefits the United States or the rest of the world. It's making yeah. everybody poorer. It's making the world chaotic. It is purely destructive. There's no upside to it. We don't win. Even if we win, we lose. So I think it's the most important thing happening in the United States. It's getting virtually no coverage here. People are only dimly aware that it's happening, that the United States, it's not a war between Ukraine and Russia. It's a war between the United States using Ukraine as a proxy force against Russia. It's the Democratic Party trying to overthrow Vladimir Putin. You don't have to love Vladimir Putin, and I don't, yeah. to think this is total lunacy. There's no benefit to us. Therefore, we should not be doing it. And it's hurting places. Smaller countries like Sri Lanka, like Vietnam, yes. are facing financial crisis because of the shutdown of natural gas from Russia. I mean, natural gas is not simply used to power factories and heat homes. It's used to make things, plastics, mm -hmm. for example. So if you have a country whose economy is based on manufacturing things made out of fossil fuels, like Vietnam's is, it, it destroys your economy. And American voters are not even aware that this is happening. And it's very frustrating. I mean, we every month we do an update. By the way, we're at war with Russia. Were you aware of that? This could end in nuclear disaster. Did you know that? And most people don't because the truth is suppressed on social media. Uh, one of the other things is that uh, I think uh, President Donald Trump used to do was to keep the money within America rather than going and policing all around the world. Uh, he was more uh, interested in, uh, you know, building bridges. He was more interested in taking care of uh, Americans uh, by American taxpayer money. But uh, we see a, a, a country like Sri Lanka, we have witnessed back in um, 2015, 2014, 2015, and right now, even in 29, uh, uh, I think about two, three mo uh, months back even, uh, United States taxpayer money is being funneled through various organizations in order to do regime changes, you know, do uh, things that are completely, if the American people knew, they will completely uh, uh, reject this flat out. Uh, what do you think about that? Like a lot of money, your taxpayer money in America is being uh, sent uh, right across from America and it is being used by other, uh, other countries and uh, it is not even to make their lives better. Uh, it is you know some kind of a political agenda to something of that sort and the Biden administration uh, the prior was uh, Obama administration then B Biden was vice president during that time also we saw a regime change where the United States actively uh, funded uh, uh, that that particular process I think around 200 million dollars also uh, but now we are, we are looking at around 40 50 million dollars so what do you think of like you know what does American things about this you know are they are they happy that their money is going overseas I think most Americans have no idea of the scale of it. I think most Americans love their country. And when they're told that their tax dollars are being used to promote democracy abroad, that sounds fine with them. They're very proud of our systems. And they think that those systems are being encouraged in other countries. I think if they knew that their tax dollars were not being used to promote democracy, but to interfere with it or end it, I think they'd be shocked and appalled. 
Um, but there's really very little sense in the United States that there's a world beyond North America. I, I hate to say that. Most Americans, you know, like Sri Lanka, we are effectively an island. We're cut off from a lot of the world. And I don't think Americans quite understand. The idea that the U.S. government, in the name of democracy, interferes mm. in democratic elections is shocking. It's shocking to me. It's completely immoral and wrong. If we say we believe in allowing voters to choose their own governance, and we say we do believe that, then we can never try to short circuit that. That's the that the core of democracy is the democratic process. It's voting for the people you want to run your country. And if the U.S. government gets in the way of that, you can't call it democracy promotion, you know, because it's not as the opposite of that. So I find it very upsetting. I've had because of my job, I've traveled a lot. I've been to a lot of countries, and I've seen this firsthand. And I just don't think that most Americans are aware of it, again, because of the relentless censorship of the U.S. media. And by the way, let me just say, most censorship in the United States, maybe it's true where you live, isn't at the level of, you know, of shutting people down, though that happens a lot. It's at the level of story selection. Yeah. So in other words, our media companies just will ignore it. It's not happening. They won't cover it because they don't think their readers or listeners or viewers should know about it. And I think that's scary. Indeed. And, and that is something that uh, uh, we find it very difficult to believe as well, because um, we always look for countries like developed nations like the United States to be actually telling us the truth and trying to work with us rather than against us because uh, if, if you just ask any Sri Lankan do you want to be friends with America they will definitely say yes but if you ask any Sri Lankan do you want America to come and meddle with our elections definitely that's a no because oh. not oh. even in America definitely nobody would uh, uh, agree with that well um, Taka I gotta leave it at that next time I would like to invite you right here uh, interview you here in Sri Lanka in Colombo in my studios and try to have a conversation and actually to get you to see uh, Sri Lanka since you have not been here I think I think you will enjoy it very much I appreciate that invitation thank you and I, I really do I would love to go to Sri Lanka so thank please, you for inviting me. please please make it a point uh, maybe your next vacation spot could be right here <laughs> thank you all right thank you very much see ya. Mr. Taka Carlson himself. Um, that's all the time we have for you tonight on this returning episode of State of the Nation. Our next program will be back on the air on 4th of December. And we will move uh, to our regular time slot on Sundays at 7 p.m. And guess what? We will have a new podcast of State of the Nation as well. Our first podcast will drop on 2nd of December 2022. Make sure you check that out. It's going to be much provocative, much open conversation, something you should certainly check out. Now, before I leave you tonight, a word of appreciation, thanks and gratitude to all my loyal viewers. Most of you did your level best to reach out to me during a very difficult period and even stood up for me. It means the world to me, the messages of comfort and encouragement and support one of the reasons for me to be back. I want to sincerely thank the Derana Senior Management for never letting me go despite it being a personal decision. And they always encourage me to be back. I also want to thank my staff, my colleagues and very especially my production team including my producers who has been an immense system of support and comfort. Thank you for joining me tonight. I'll see you back on Sunday, the 4th of December, 2022. Have a good night.